What are some of these near-term catastrophic risks? Well, uh, as of today, we are in a war that has moved the atomic clock closer to midnight than it has ever been. And if we were to write a book about the folly of the history of human hubris, dealing with nukes and AI and things like that, we could easily have the last chapter in that book if we are not more careful about confident, wrong ideas. The dawn chorus that no one wants to hear. Air raid sirens in Kyiv signaling that the full-scale invasion of a European country had started a few hours earlier. We've seen the emergence of war, the warnings of nuclear weapons use. A nuclear war can not be won. We've seen the failure of COP27 to come up with any serious attempts to curb the activities of the fossil fuel industry. And we've seen the emergence of new artificial intelligence capabilities, which we still haven't really grasped the full extent of the risks that that has for humanity. The scientists and experts have called on the world to act, declaring AI an existential threat to humanity on a par with the risk of nuclear war. everyone. Today we have Liv Burry uh, joining us. Uh, Liv is a former professional poker player. He's done. Who <laughs> got interested in game theory and all things Moloch. Hello gorgeous, my name is Moloch. The last time we discussed Moloch at the Stoa was Daniel Schmachtenberger session. Daniel Schmachtenberger is the founder and director of the Consilience Project, and he is an expert in the catastrophes that can end civilizations and how we might thread that narrow needle to avoid them. Moloch was originally coined, apparently back in the like Canaanite times. There was supposedly this death cult who would sacrifice their children to this awful demon god thing they called Moloch in order to get power to win wars. The Israelites, the neighbors of Canaan, are so horrified by the child sacrifice occurring in Canaan that it's going to be mentioned as a sin throughout the Old Testament and it's going to be a damned offense. Whether they actually existed or not, we don't know, but in mythology they, they did, and this god that they worshipped was this thing called Moloch. This movie Metropolis in 1927 talked about there was this incredible futuristic city that everyone was living great, but then the protagonist goes underground into the sewers and sees that the city is run by this machine. And this machine basically would just like kill the workers all the time because it was just so hard to keep it running. So there was all this suffering that was required in order to keep the city going. And then the protagonist has this vision that this machine is actually this demon Moloch. So again, it's like this sort of like mechanistic consumption of humans in order to get more power. And then Allen Ginsberg wrote a poem called Howl about this thing, Moloch. I saw the best minds of my generation You and I and many people in our sphere both came across this frame from Scott Alexander's Meditations on Moloch paper. But what was like the mental upgrade when you got the concept of Moloch? You're like, oh, sh like now I understand this. It was reading Meditations on Moloch by Scott Alexander. It just, it was the closest thing to like a religious experience of reading a piece of writing. He analyzes the poem and he's like, okay, so it seems to be something relating to where competition goes wrong. Moloch was historically this thing of like where people would sacrifice a thing that they care about, in this case, their own children, in order to gain power, a competitive advantage. And if you look at almost everything that sort of goes wrong in our society, it's that same process. Probably the most concise definition I can give is that it's the god of negative sum games, like unhealthy competitive situations. So by that I mean like a system of bad incentives that incentivize agents within that system, players within that game, to sacrifice more and more of their other values in order to win the game. And by doing this, they're essentially taking selfish actions that externalize harms to everybody else, both within that game and also to the wider system as a whole, and hence making the game a negative something. 
these short-term incentives to do this thing that like either sacrifices your integrity or something else in order to like stay competitive, which on aggregate creates this like sort of race to the bottom spiral where everyone else ends up in a situation which is worse off than they were before. But they're all stuck in the same dilemma of if I don't use this tactic, I'll get outcompeted by all the others who do. So I have to do it too. What it's trying to get to is if every environmental issue, from dead zones in the ocean to plastics and waste in the ocean yeah. to all of these issues, nobody wants, but also nobody can stop because the cost of someone stopping it disadvantages them relative to everyone else. If everyone else is going to continue to externalize that cost to the commons rather than internalize it and decrease their profit margins. When we look at features of the world that nobody wants and that are bad for everyone, why can't we change them? This is where the Moloch frame comes in. And if all of the things that are moving us towards increased likelihood for global catastrophic risk, or at least many of them have this in common, this is an underlying feature that we have to really understand, right? Could you give a couple examples of what that looks like? And why thinking about it as a god is at all an interesting frame? An example I gave in uh, my first Moloch video, uh, The Beauty Wars, is about these beauty filters that have now become completely commonplace on Instagram and in fact on most social media platforms. Penny skirt on, dip my body in glitter. The reason why these things are sort of so particularly molecky is that everyone who's trying to sort of play the beauty influencer game or any kind of influencer game, frankly, on these platforms, you get directly rewarded with more likes and follows if your pictures look better, if your face looks better, you know, your complexion is clearer. And these filters started appearing where not only would they make your face look smoother, but they would just like tweak your features in really, really subtle ways. This filter should be illegal. Here's the real me. Gosh. Make your face basically converge upon this, seem like normalized beauty standards, but do successfully seem to hijack people's brains. People do like these. Hello, it's time for your semi regular reminder that everything that you see on the internet is bullshit. See, as I'm sitting here now, I can change the color of my eyes. I can change the shape of my jaw and the size of my nose. I would upload a picture of myself that I loved and then I would apply the filter to it and then I would compare the two side by side and I would now no longer like the original picture. You know, it makes you hate your natural face. And yet, despite knowing this, because you know, you know, you get the direct reward of getting more likes and follows by using these things. And then on top of that, you know that everyone else is using them as well. And so if you don't use them, then you're essentially going to get like left behind the curve. You're no longer going to be competitive in, in the influencing game. It's a really classic example of molecky bad incentives driving a kind of like race to the bottom where everyone ends up miserable. No one wants to be using these things, but feels like they have no choice if they want to stay competitive. in his Tour de France, now he has ridden fast and dropped his rivals, Mano O oh Mano. So now he is going to cross the line, I think. This will be some victory salute. It'll be a while before we know if it is as the winner of the Tour de France. When you realize that pretty much all the best guys are doing this now, what is that feeling like when you're like, okay, I've got to cross over into this deceptive territory and I have to be a part of this sort of, this underground aspect that's a part of this great sport? Right. There was a time where you go from being one of the best guys in the country, top rated new professional in the sport, to barely being able to hold on to the, the peloton. It was a, quite a drastic change and um, you know, we were all kind of thrown into this dark era of the sport. When do you realize in 94 like something's wrong? I mean it was overnight. Between 93 and 94 there was a tectonic shift. At first it was very difficult to comprehend or gauge how pervasive the doping problem was in the sport of cycling. And then I arrived at the, in the big leagues in 1997. That was when I did my first Tour de France. And that's when I realized, you know, wow, it's everywhere. You know, they're handing out white lunch bags full of, you know, performance enhancing drugs to guys. Do you believe that to win the Tour de France, one must dope? Of course. I think that every single cyclist, at least from 1991 till 2011, was on highly, highly augmented programs. Nobody wanted to be in that position. It's not like any of us growing up as kids thought, dude, I'm gonna go to Europe and get all doped up and try to win bikers. No, nobody wanted to be there. Like we all went with pure intentions and this shit was messy. And we're like, whoa, okay. 
do we go home or do we stay and fight? Literally almost everybody stayed and fought, and we fought the way that, that the fight was being fought. The top 20 guys like all tested positive yeah. for roid. So our roided up guy beat your roided up guy. Okay? And of all the people that won the Tour de France and all the years that you did it, if you go back to people that either weren't implicated or didn't test right. positive, like what is it, like 18th place or something crazy like that? The North American Air Defense Command is near Colorado Springs. Radar signals come in here from the distant early warning system to signal any enemy attack. It is the commander of this base in the Colorado mountains who, on his own authority, could order a nuclear response to any enemy attack that penetrates American or Canadian territory. We didn't actually have world-ending tech. We didn't have the capacity to ruin everything rapidly until World War II and the bomb. The bomb allowed something where a rapid escalation could destroy kind of everything. There were 200,000 years of Homo sapien history before that. We couldn't destroy everything quickly, and then we could. So that was a bright line in the sand, and that was very recent. Initially, the U.S. started the Manhattan Project because they believed that the Nazis were developing this weapon. And if Nazi Germany got the bomb first, that would be a terrible world to live in. And that's why otherwise pacifistic people like Robert Oppenheimer joined this effort to build this devastating technology. I drafted a question which the aide to McGeorge Bundy, Bob Comer, sent to the Joint Chiefs in the name of the president. And the question was, in the event of your carrying out your general nuclear war plans, which were first strike plans, how many will die? So they came back with an answer very quickly. A total of 600 million people. A hundred holocausts. It is necessary now to make a choice, to choose between two admittedly regrettable, but nevertheless distinguishable post-war environments. One where you got 20 million people killed, and the other where you got 150 million people killed. You're talking about mass murder, General, not war. So in what way does the Moloch dynamic apply to the nuclear dilemma? Well, I think Moloch is how you get 60,000 nuclear weapons deployed in the 1980s aimed at each other. It all starts with this security dilemma, which is in a state of anarchy, as you are in the state of international relations. States, in order to make themselves more secure, build up armaments to address external threats. But in doing that, they inherently threaten their neighbors and their potential adversaries who will then build up their own armaments, which then creates new threats. Both sides would prefer to spend virtually nothing on defense and be able to provide for the needs of their people. But so long as one is doing it, the other has to. ChatGPT, which is based on GPT-4 from OpenAI, which right. is a company that I... Uh played a, uh, a critical role in, in creating, unfortunately. Uh, Back when it was a non-profit? <sighs> yes. So, so, you know, the original story that I heard on OpenAI when you were founded as a non-profit, where well, you were there as the great sort of check on the big companies doing their unknown, possibly evil thing with AI, and you were going to build models that sort of somehow held them accountable and, and slowing the field down if need be. The reason for starting OpenAI was to create a counterweight to Google and DeepMind, which at the time had two-thirds of all AI talent and basically infinite money and compute, and there was no, there was no counterweight. It was a unipolar world. And through whatever series of things happened, the thing that was originally a nonprofit dedicated to safety is a public corporation for profit, wholly owned subsidiary of Microsoft, deploying in uh, competitive types of races against other ones. The firing shot was when ChatGPT launched a year ago. It is the embryonic version of online artificial intelligence, the early front runner, but it is then the new frontier for the tech giants. When that happens, if you're Google or Anthropic, are you going to sit there and say, we're going to keep doing this slow and steady safety work in the lab and not release our stuff? No. As you may have heard, AI is having a very busy year. 
There's a new AI chatbot called Claude 2. You know, the Google guy saying that he's the problem, you know, like they're the problem, like they started it or they shouldn't have let this out of the bag. You know, one of the things we need to be careful when it comes to AI is avoid what I would call race conditions, where people working on it across companies, etc., so get caught up in who's first that we lose, you know, the potential pitfalls and downsides to it. There's just so much commercial pressure, you know, if you take any of these leaders of the top tech companies, if you pause, but those guys don't pause, we don't want to get our lunch eaten. But the problem with that is that it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the default there is that we all end up doing it. That technology is moving so quickly that even those who are on top of it can't keep up. It can be very harmful if deployed wrongly. And we don't have all the answers there yet, and the technology is moving fast. So does that keep me up at night? Absolutely. So I've been keeping a little list here of potential downsides or harms, risks, of generative AI, even in its current form. Let's just run through it. Loss of jobs, manipulation of personal behavior, manipulation of personal opinions, and potentially the degradation of free elections in America. Did I miss anything? Raise your right hand. Misinformation, generation of deep fakes. A new government report now identifying a major risk that artificial intelligence could have on the U.S. financial system. Specifically, Anthropic is concerned that AI could empower a much larger set of actors to misuse biology. I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. Jeffrey Hinton made headlines with his recent departure from Google. What I've been talking about mainly is what I call the existential threat, which is the chance that they get more intelligent than us. And more technical. They are racing to systems that are extremely powerful that they themselves know they cannot control. You think that's real? It is, it is conceivable that AI could take control and reach a point where you couldn't turn it off and it would be making decisions for people. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, that's definitely the where things are headed. We're really at a crossroads. We could have everything we could dream of if we were careful, but we could have a nightmare beyond contemplation if we're not. I'm not saying I know what the right trade-off between acceleration and safety is, mm. but I do know that we'll never find out what that right trade-off is if we let Moloch dictate it for us. I think without the public pressure, none of them can push back against their shareholders alone, no matter how good-hearted they are. Smolok is a really powerful foe. But does it seem like it's possible to do something and it doesn't seem like there's any motivation whatsoever to do something? Or are we just talking? The answer is coordination. Yeah. This is the largest coordination problem in humanity's history. That's actually what we're lacking at the moment, is that we don't have an international mechanism for coordinating among competing nations, competing corporations to drive the peace. In fact, we're actually going kind of in the opposite direction. We're resorting to the old school language of a clash of civilization. The playing field is finite. And if we keep playing these adversarial zero sum games, thinking that in order for us to win, someone else has to lose, or if we lose that, you know, someone else wins, that will extinct us. I think the only hope for our future safety must lie in a collaboration based on confidence and good faith with the other peoples of the world.